Goedemorgen allemaal. Uh, mijn naam is uh, Maart van der Schaaf. Welkom bij ons uh, webinar over uh, produceren in India. Um, zoals jullie wellicht gemerkt hebben, jullie, jullie staan allemaal op mute. En wij kunnen jullie niet zien, maar jullie kunnen dus alleen mij zien en uh, mijn collega Shavikesh Goel. Uh, Shavikesh is in... Uh, I'll, I'll, switch to, uh, I'll switch to English immediately. Uh, Shavikesh is, uh, is based in, uh, in Delhi, working from home, as uh, almost the whole of India is, and almost all of the world is, actually. Um, and, well, great that you are all here. Uh, as you cannot say anything, you can use the chat box to ask something. So Shavikesh has a as a, a presentation for around half an hour, uh, maybe maybe longer. Let's see, and then uh, we will discuss the the questions that come in in uh, in the chat. And some of you have also uh, uh, already uh, wrote to us some some questions that uh, need to be discussed. Um, before we start, we do a a quick short poll to see where everybody is and at what stage they are in, in India. So if you, this, these are three questions, so please, please answer and then uh, uh, click on the answer and then we can go on when everybody has voted. Okay, so half of the crowd is considering setting up their own factory. Uh, a third is thinking of outsourcing, and uh, the remaining 17% uh, is uh, is not sure yet. It's also good for you to know uh, Shavikesh, of course, in your presentation. Second question: Where are your production facilities currently based? In the Netherlands, in Europe, and or US? In Asia, or a combination of the above? Please go ahead. Okay, this is also interesting. A third says only in the Netherlands, in Europe and the US, another third. 17% uh, is already in Asia, and 70% is uh, in a combination of the above. So relatively new to Asia. And then final question is, do you have experience working in or with India? Ah, that's uh, that's good. There, there is experience with working in a, in, in India, 100%. Okay, thanks uh, for this information. This is also Shavikesh uh, gives you a bit some some insight on uh, on on who's around. Um, Shavikesh has been in uh, has been doing business development for a long time uh, in India. Uh, has been in, involved with uh, the setups of yeah, quite a number of foreign companies in. Uh, in, in India and also specifically in uh, manufacturing, uh, setting up manufacturing. So I'm curious to uh, to hear your story, Shavikesh. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, colleagues from Europe and those from India, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our webinar here. I'll take you through this uh, short presentation I've made. Uh, I'll try to make it more interactive. As uh, Martin said before, if you have queries while I'm speaking, please feel free to write those in the chat box. And uh, if possible, wherever possible, I'll also try to answer as I'm you know, making the presentation. We'll start with a few basic facts about India. Since, uh, as, the, as for the poll, every one of you has experience of working with India. So I don't think uh, I'd have to really educate you on what India is or who India is, but maybe. A small primer on what India stands for. So India is the world's fifth largest economy with a GDP of about 2.8 trillion dollars. These are of course numbers just before COVID. At the moment the numbers are different but it's, it's a matter of you know, a few months when we are back to normal. It is the seventh largest country in the world. Uh, I give this comparison to Europe so it's about one third the size of Europe but has twice the, uh, the size of population of Europe. 
so you can imagine the 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 amount of you know um, diversity which india could uh, you know encompass in such a you know uh, small area um this the third point could be interesting for everyone you know the growth in india's working age population is more than the growth of the dependent population now why is it interesting or should be interesting for everyone you know this means that we have a larger working population younger working population which by the way also doubles up as your consumers than the dependent population so the problem of the developed world is it's a growing population right there are not enough young people uh, to work and also the consumers are also less enough so that way india is in a very unique uh, position and this is going to last till 2055 so about 30 plus years from today till the next you know 30 odd years 30 plus years you have uh, you know a double let's say advantage with india one a growing market uh, young people who are getting into the you know and i'll tell you what more about what is the demographics how is it split the next one but uh, here so you'll see how the population will continue to be available as consumers as well as doers you know you need people to work so we have people who can also work and uh, last but not the least india has the second largest english speaking population in the world maybe the legacy of the british when they were here in india for some time and when they left uh, the good thing they left was uh, english so almost everyone speaks english at least for the business everyone speaks english that i think is a good thing for you uh, it's it makes it easy to do business now coming to the current situation i'll just take maybe uh, half a minute on what what's uh, about covid and beyond covid so first the situation about covid in india so as of today there are about 5.2 million cases in india uh, sorry fifth uh, yeah, yeah. 5.2 million cases in india and uh, the recovery rate which is a positive uh, good sign is about 80% so 80% of this 5.2 million people have already recovered um but yes the numbers are increasing of late in the last two or weeks the number uh, you know the increase in the number has gone rapidly higher also because there are more number of tests which are you know being conducted by almost all the states and cities but looking at you know what has happened globally in terms of the supply chain uh, disruptions especially the manufacturing supply chain disruptions right both the central government the federal government in india and india is a democracy you know it's a federal democracy so the federal government and the state governments realize that you know the dependence or the over dependence of most of the uh, you know companies or countries uh, has been on china right now because of the disruptions due to covid um, and chinese supplies were you know stopped also sometimes because of the us you know uh, fighting with china also is leading to some disruptions so the governments in india are already aware of this fact they are now modifying their policies whether they are fiscal policies their labor policies how to attract the companies which might want to look at india as either an alternative destination for manufacturing or to move their manufacturing from china or other places where they got stuck uh, one of the key things which has happened uh, in this direction is already was done last year much before covid happened october 2019 is that if you now set up a new manufacturing company in india the income tax rate is only 15% right if you set up a new company for manufacturing in india which probably is the lowest or among the lowest income tax rates anywhere in the world right so that is something which uh, is is the government is already thinking of next so uh, taking forward the the first slide you know the basic facts now why you should look at manufacturing in india so one the basic thing is that you know it's a fast growing domestic market right so unlike in china which typically everyone went there to produce for the world right manufacture for the world and later then china also became a market in india you come first to make for you know the domestic consumption and of course then take it forward to export to other countries as well so india's gdp growth has been around 7% more or less in the last few years um if you are following the global economists you no know, whether it's the world bank or imf or everyone they almost all of them even today the asian development bank has also predicted that uh, by the uh, mid or beginning of mid of 2021 beginning of 2022 india would have already recovered 
and the asian development bank today has predicted a growth of 8% in 2022 which is about a year and a half max not even a year and a half a year and a quarter from now that's what they are anticipating expecting so the recovery for india would be like a v that's what almost everyone is saying yes right now it's very low but they're expecting a fast recovery so that's the first reason why you should look at manufacturing in india to get into the domestic market also the make in india campaign you must have heard of this make in india campaign you know prime minister modi started the campaign about 5 years ago four and a half five years ago and here it's the first time in the country's history you know of close to 75 odd years that the government has sincerely very seriously thought of projecting the country as a manufacturing destination so hence the make in india campaign is is a step in that direction and that also helps you in ease of doing business ease of setting up your manufacturing facilities there will be challenges as well i'll discuss those later but that's one initiative which is is encouraged uh, gst i think all of you since you have experience of working with india i saw that during the poll so goods and services tax which came a few years ago has actually made india as a single market you know india is a complex country since you know about india it's a large complex market both geographically and demographically the gst is is one such thing you can produce in one place and then still be able to sell across the country legal system is something which every company when they invest money when you are manufacturing you of course will be investing money right you need to ensure that your money is secured legal system is you know based on the old british common law uh, important for you to know is that the contracts whatever contracts you sign whether during your construction activities or later they are signed in english which means what you read what you sign is what is there you are not reading in english and signing in some other language like in china i understand you sign in chinese on a chinese paper so you are not really sure what you read was exactly what is translated right so that helps similarly intellectual property this is one more area which is of concern for companies to manufacture because when you bring in your technology right you are always you know concerned that will there be protection for our technology or not because that's where your real investment has been right you spent years and then millions of you know uh, dollars or euros of uh, your money in r&d to develop those technologies so what if somebody takes it away right what if there's a bill for it uh, how do you protect yourself so that way because we have a strong legal system in place we also a democracy so there is a rule of law so there again the laws are very strong and the government doesn't look the other way right so if if you have a, a problem and uh, you find that somebody has infringed on your intellectual property you can actually knock on the uh, you know, courts doors and there is a resolution in fact in ip cases there is a faster resolution because the government understands that this is an is a critical you know uh, reason or critical feature why somebody would or would not come to india to manufacture now in addition to these uh, factors there are some soft factors also we are a large country we have enough natural resources we have uh, 300 clear sunny days why i say clear sunny days it's always interesting to mention this um european countries especially the western european countries you know even though they are smaller in size have really hard and, and have lesser uh, solar and you know, power available but they really harness the solar energy the wind renewable energy i mean if you look in the netherlands also right i see a lot of wind farms in the ocean uh, right you have developed that so imagine a country where so much of uh, natural abundance is there of resources how much more can you really uh, make out of that we have almost all the minerals which are there they are available in india so mining is also a good industry coming to the demographics i mentioned in my earlier slide so if you look at the, the uh, availability of young professionals and workers right so there are about the 862 million people you know india is about 1.35 billion people in total that's that's a large population with the second most populous country in the world and how does that stack up you know how does that split and what is in it for you So about 860 odd million people are between the age of 15 and 64 years, which is the actual working age, right? And if you further split it down, there are 630 million people, which are in the real age working age, 25 and 64 years. Now imagine uh, this is about half of the population which is in this age group, which is available to work. Many of them, you know, a majority of them are also literate. Many of them are skilled. right the level of skills of course could vary from people to people person to person but they are there 
and this actually is a great demographic dividend which the prime minister modi you know keeps talking of almost every time he speaks on international forum now coming to the affordability always you know comparisons are with china so china has kind of set the benchmark for the world in how effective can you be when you it comes to the, the cost of you know producing when it comes to the people cost you will be surprised to see that the minimum wage for a skilled worker in india is about 1.25 us dollars per hour uh, which is even lower than china china yes it was much cheaper maybe 25 30 years ago even 20 years ago but of late in the last 5 7 10 years costs have been going up in china so from that perspective also india is an interesting you know uh, market to look at manufacturing and geographically if you see uh, we are kind of in the center of you know between europe and asia pacific on one hand from far east to africa if you see on the other hand and talking of africa which is also another continent where a lot of companies are focusing right it's it's it's, it's the future emerging market maybe in the next 5 10 15 years but already companies have started investing over there so from that perspective also if you want to serve the african market from india many companies are already doing that both indian companies and international companies using india as a base for supplying in the region and that way india you can just draw a radius around in you know, a circle around india works well now these were of course the positives right why you should look at setting up manufacturing in india of course there will be issues uh, you know when you set up a factory in india and india is still an emerging market uh, things are still developing we are a developing country not a developed the pace of development is fast but still when you come from a developed world there will be certain things which you would expect uh, as a given right whereas in india you might really have to rethink so you might have to think of how did I, how did i do this 20 years ago in my country maybe you will have to do it that way so it helps to look at some of the key issues which if you are aware of your journey of setting up a factory or a production facility will be much smoother seamless right a few pointers are here and i will explain all of these in the coming slides so starts with location selection where should you set up in india then is land search and selection so whatever place you decide in india then getting the right land you know and what should you consider when you are looking at land then very important government approvals india still is bureaucratic since you have experience of working in india i am sure you also would have experienced some form of bureaucracy i guess uh, design coordination which is the next step you know once you have started to get your drawings you know from the drawing table from the drawing board to execution so how do you coordinate that key contractors there could be another you know problematic area that the contractors who will deliver who will build your factories on the site what issues quality i think needless to mention if you are coming from the western world uh, and you look at look at india quality always is looked at with a question mark um and yes there are reasons for that because of past experiences so how do you overcome that timelines similar to quality timelines is something which again when you look at india uh, punctuality could be again one thing which may not be something which uh, you might consider coming naturally to india or indians but again how do you overcome that cost even though the cost of construction in india would be lower than let's say in the netherlands or in, elsewhere in europe but there again what are the issues which you should uh, take care of and last but not the least very important is safety so i will uh, touch upon these points uh, one by one uh, i'll not bore you i'll be quick as possible and then of course we can take up questions and please keep writing your questions wherever you, know, you think you have to so first is location selection now india is a very large country right and almost the entire country is inhabited it's not that in some pockets we have uh, <clears throat> population living and the rest of the country is not so almost everywhere you see we are populated if you look at the night uh, google earth uh, you know map of india you will see uh, it's almost everywhere is light right it's not that india is vacant half of the country no so uh, and from experience whatever i'll tell you in these coming slides is from experience of setting up those factories for you know, european companies in india so you'll be surprised that most of the companies you know, this this may be a no brainer but most of the companies prefer to go to a location where one of their acquaintances or neighbors in their home country have gone and set up a factory gives them some comfort 
you know, so if my, my neighboring company has set up a factory in India in Pune, for example, or Delhi or Mumbai, wherever, I will also go there. The reasons for that company to set up a factory there would be completely for their you no know, businesses, right? If you just follow them because of the comfort you get, you know, because they are my neighbors here, they'll be neighbors there, it'll be an interesting you know, ecosystem I'll create. I strongly recommend not to do that. And unfortunately, most companies don't do a proper location analysis, which should be done, but they don't do it, right? I would recommend doing it because India is very, very, very diverse. I repeat, it's an extremely diverse country, right? Every 50 kilometers, the dialect changes. You know, we have over 4,000 languages and dialects in the country, 21 official languages, 18 of which you can see on a currency note. So India is it's a very diverse and you know, complex country. It makes sense. It is worth you investing in time and you know uh, some money to get this done so that you know for sure why you're going to a place. You may still go to the same place where your neighbor went, but then now you know why I go there. Not because he said, I am here, so please come to uh, you know, my location, right? So, uh, because uh, you don't choose or you change locations every time. You know, once you decide, you would be there for next maybe 15, 20, 30 years at least, till you decide to either expand or move to a different location. So what our advice normally is, what MNB advice is, is that you should get a location analysis done, a proper formal one, <clears throat> not some syndicated you know, uh, report, which you just download from the internet, because that will not tell you why you should you know, go to some place. It will just tell you the pros and cons of various uh, places in India, right? And this should, uh, whatever analysis you should do, should consider about your specific business, right? It should address your requirements. You should list down your requirements. That this is what I typically if I have to set up a factory in Europe. These are the things I have to take care of. And then you extrapolate that to India. And then figure out what of these things will not be relevant in India. Or what of those things will be extra, extra, and you have to be cautious in India. So this is something which you should do without any biases. Yes, the decisions in the end are always taken on a gut feel. I, I agree with that. But when you have enough facts on the table, right? Then I think using your gut is a better idea than just going by gut. Because once you decide on that, that feeling in your stomach, maybe right feeling may not be right feeling. But once it is done, you can't do much about it. So we go to the next one. So after location, the most important thing is finding the right land. So let's say you have chosen after all analysis, you say, okay, let me go to uh, Gujarat, for example, or, or let's say Pune, because Pune is more popular, you know city so maybe you understand Chennai, wherever, wherever. now again these are big cities you know india is a big country so they're bigger cities so where in that city or whatever town you go to where should you buy land and while you're uh, you know buying that land or searching for the land what are the things which you might come across and what you should take care of so one of course the tendency always is to go for cheaper land i think it's logical because you're setting up a factory, there'll be expenses on, you know, a lot of other things, building, plant and machinery, later people as well. So you try to minimize the cost on the land, which is the right strategy commercially. But in the process, you should not miss out on, you know, the other aspects which might actually affect your factory while it's being set up or for future perspectives. So look at again the parameters which you need to have in the land, irrespective of the cost of the land. That's the first thing you should do. And then you should try and find in that city what are the kind of land or, you know, pieces available which fit the criteria. And then you can one by one eliminate. Now, what, um, what are the ways to find bright land? I'll tell you after I tell this second point. And the second point is that the land search, the time duration which you budget, you should be very careful about that. When you talk to people, you know, typically what you would do is if you're, let's say, sitting in Europe, you might make some phone calls from there, look on the internet, find some people who will say, yes, we have land available. And you will get time as you have within two months, three months, one month, we'll get you, you know, all the land and all done. But always please, you know, budget a little longer time because it could take much longer than anticipated, not only finding the right land, but also the getting the process of the land registered in your name could also take time, right? Uh, our advice uh, for land search and then what kind of land should you take is typically you should go for government land if it is available. Most of the times it is not available. Why I'm saying government land? Because then the titles are clear. 
you will not have any legal issues later right not somebody will come up to you say yeah this part of the you know 10 acres you've taken this small finder square meters is mine and you have no right so i will file a case in the court so in government land you are assured that's a clear title land but uh, and the government has set up you know industrial development corporations uh, in different parts of the country now sometimes you may not get land in those development corporations so what should you do there are a lot of you know reputable indian companies big indian groups who have set up private industrial parks so they are similar to the industrial development corporations but they are private entities the price will be slightly higher because they will first buy the land from uh, the government and then sell it to you but then you are assured of again declared title and all the amenities in, in the, the facility so and which may not be available if you just go for a private land yes of course if you don't get either the government land or a private industrial park what should you do then of course you have to go and buy individual land private individual land so land let's say owned by me and you say okay fine shavikesh you have this land and we need this five acres so can you sell us but they, there are millions of people who would have land in india so how do you decide which one so one thumb rule should be that the land should be close to an industrial development corporation a developed industrial development corporation or a private industrial park so the advantage is that even though you will buy a land without any amenities the fact that they are in a close close proximity in the vicinity of other industrial parks so you get the benefit of you know having that ecosystem in place whether it could be from suppliers from you know, other services providers utilities it helps so that's where uh, and the one thing which you when you go for buying private land very important to understand is that you should not <clears throat> buy land which is of agriculture nature so please always understand whether the land is uh, classified as non agriculture na non agriculture also whatever the term they use uh, these two terms are used uh, if if it is an agriculture land please don't buy you will find many people who will say yes there's no problem it's an agriculture land but we will get it converted for you please first get it converted then only pay money don't invest your money beforehand because there are chances that it may never get converted and you that's similar, the... that's similar in the netherlands so uh, we uh, listeners will know will will recognize that okay <clears throat> so in india you're not allowed to set up you know uh, factories on agricultural land but yeah. there are enough by by night operators who will promise you no 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 worries we will get it done for you so tell them please get it done and then we will move forward that that's how you should just a small piece of advice yeah yeah next <clears throat> thank you martin uh yeah now once you've got your you know location in place you've got your land in place and then you know uh, you want to now start right activities so uh i think as as in any other country india as well you need government approvals right before you start you know hitting the ground to start your construction activities now there is a bureaucracy i mentioned earlier and uh sometimes i'm not saying always and some states may be more bureaucratic than the others but more or less the the pattern remains the, the same or similar pattern so it could take longer than planned so when you're planning your timelines you must consider these soft factors because maybe back home you don't really you know worry about these uh, topics right you know that if it is 10 days for this approval it will come in 10 days time if it is two weeks it will come in two weeks time it is one day it's one day it's defined and it works like clockwork in india also we have definitions for every approval it's not that uh, approvals will have whatever whimsical that this might take one month this might take one day no for each of these specifics there will be either a specified time or a rough guideline on how much time will it take but that doesn't mean that it will be followed that way so be prepared for that there's a common thing called single window clearance and i'm i'm sure if if some of you have tried you know uh, at least looking around how to set up a factory in india you will see many states offer this thing called single window clearance which means that you know you just go to that one window so called it's like one one authority you give them the application and they will coordinate all the approvals internally now on, on paper it works very well but in practice it does not because inside that one window there would be 10 12 15 different windows different departments you know different entities different authorities which would need uh, to give approval 
and sometimes the approvals could be you know delayed or not given for some very flimsy reasons uh, maybe your documentation was not proper right maybe one document was missing nobody realized that but because of it the entire file will be sent back they also no no again this was missing how could you miss this thing and this goes on and on and on so how do you overcome that because you cannot change the system how it is a system by the way has improved a lot in the last 5 7 years i can assure you that it was much much more difficult 7 8 years ago when uh, we used to set up practice as compared to now but still there are teething troubles so what you should do is one more most important thing is that all the necessary documentation should be in place right you should set it in advance and verify it with experts on the ground who will tell you that yes everything is in proper order before you submit it to the authorities that saves you a lot of time and also a lot of iterations are saved that way right because then the documents which you let's say your engineering drawings for example right you would have it done uh, as per your own standards indian standards would need some modifications now if you don't do that say no no i am going to set up the same dutch level factory in india as as i have there uh, you your file may be sent back that the drawings don't match as per the standards so please modify so all these things can you know, waste time so we do this beforehand so that the final drawing and the file which goes to the authorities uh, helps you start the process seamlessly and in this case as i said already that you should take the help of local consultants both for getting approvals and also for understanding how to really fill in those forms and how the documentation should be there is a standard particular way of presenting that to a government official if it is not that way uh, the file may be rejected rejected means it goes back to the same process and may again take one month two month you know to get it back so that's where it's important to take care of these things next so the next one is design coordination uh, design coordination obviously has nothing to do with the government right once you have submitted your designs then the government will come later to figure out that is the building as per the drawings you submitted the design you submitted or have you made any modifications without seeking government's approval while the construction was going on but this design coordination is between multiple agencies you know the different agencies not the authorities but the private agencies who will work on the project starting from the uh, with the architect then the project management company the con the main civil contractor and the other you know utilities contractors this would also include other you know suppliers for example suppliers of the fire fighting system right or supplies if you have let's say <clears throat> injection molding machines right so you need a cooling system for that right so there will be specialists who will come in uh, for that particular job and then they will execute it right there will be different consultants and there will be mep consultants and mechanical electrical plumbing consultants so all of these agencies if you see typically on a project there will be at least all put together between 50 to 60 different vendors whether they are designers whether they are service providers whether they are suppliers of equipment or utilities so imagine the chaos it could lead to between these 50 60 different vendors if it is not properly coordinated so which is where i am laying a little more emphasis on this area because this could also lead to delays delays means cost escalations that's the first fallout of cost escalation of delays second of course is your whole plan to launch the product again you know shifts further so all these things could be avoided what are the typical issues one <coughs> excuse me one faces so first of all there should be an understanding on the various um, requirements the technical requirements between the architects and the designers right because the architect is the first you know person or the agency which will visualize the whole uh, building right and everything in the building and outside of the building but that the same thing has to be translated and understood by the ones who are going to execute it the architect is not going to construct the building right they will design it so if there is a gap in the understanding it has to be set right at that point itself <coughs> excuse me then because there will be various agencies working right they all should be on the same understanding it should not be that after 6 months or 4 months in the construction process when the electrical guy comes in then he says sorry but you know this is not uh, how it it can be done your design is not not proper or the way you have constructed i'll have to break several you know walls or break several things to get my you know wiring uh, properly done and you say but this was already in the design beforehand where were you why did you not say it back then so all these things have to be they all have to be brought on the same page and believe you me from experience i can tell you in india it's like the murphy's law if it can go wrong it will go wrong and, and when you know that the murphy's law will apply then you already preempt that 
Now, this is something which is different from the developed world, right? From the Western way of thinking. Because certain things are given. You know that if I have hired a professional, he will or she will work, or that agency will work the professional way. Why should I be asking them, you know, no, no, every time checking and rechecking and monitoring? Uh, in India, you have to. Right. So, uh, what is our advice on design coordination? So, first of all, the, the initial selection, the, the agencies, the architects and the designers, you know, these three or four key core agencies, has to be more detailed and more carefully they have to be selected. Unlike maybe in your home country, you know if it's a reputable in architect, it's a given. I'm not saying that uh, these agencies in India are not competent, they are equally competent. But what you have in your mind, unless it is really, really articulated on the ground with them and there's an understanding, it's like a feedback mechanism. You know, if I'm saying something, if you don't understand, I don't even ask you, did you understand? I will assume that you understood and you will say, Shavikesh did not ask me again. I waited for Shavikesh. The result is a chaos, right? So when uh, you really start on the ground, everyone will say, but I, I understood differently. You, know? you did not explain to me. You did not come back to me. And it's a plain game later. So to avoid that. And I think more important uh, than that, is to have a supervisory agency. You know, we call it the program management, right? Program manager. An agency who has experience of working with international companies, setting up their plants in India, and also understands all the aspects. So, in a way, let's say your representative, you know, who will understand from your perspective and translate it in the Indian language. I'm not saying English, but the Indian way of you know, doing things. That ensures that there is uh, almost seamless. I'm saying almost. It's impossible to achieve 100% seamlessness in India. So anyone who commits that or promises you is, is actually lying to you through their teeth and is fooling himself or fooling themselves, right? It is not possible. But how do you manage to reduce those you know, glitches, those gaps in understanding? Is something which can be achieved? Yeah. Look, you shortly interrupt you there right? because someone is also asking on the on the chat. Uh, is it recommended to find a local Indian partner in setting up a local production facility? Um, and so now you say that you need a supervisory agency for the design coordination, but for the other steps that you mentioned before and probably for the steps after, um, yeah, there needs someone. There needs to be someone who's doing the program management. And should this be someone who is coordinating this out of Holland or someone out of the Netherlands being sent to India for the time <clears throat> being, or should this be an Indian uh, partner that has also share in the company? Should this be? Who should this? Who should this be? Uh, what is so the? This should be, yeah, I understood Martin your question. Uh, so this should be an independent agency. See, when you say we should have a local partner as a joint venture, it's a different thing, right? So I'm not saying joint venture, shareholding partner. No, no, that you can still have. You know, that's a way of setting up your business. I'm talking of setting up your facility, a manufacturing or production facility. So there, this should be an Indian company which has experience of doing this and which will coordinate. When I say program management, it is end to end. You know, it is from the state of selecting a location to finding yeah. the land for right then to the design coordination right uh, getting all the approvals in place now the entire layers now with the government right ensuring that the project management is done properly that the timelines are met that the number of you know people which are needed to be deployed the labor and everyone is is taken care of so it is like a common thread which will run through the entire you know uh, process yeah. of, of setting up <laughs> this agency will work under your supervision which means you might have in your company your you know head of construction or establishment different companies have different you know real estate whatever you call it. an expert in your company who knows how to set up factories as per your own uh, requirements so under whose guidance and his or her guidance is what this indian agency will work and then okay. that person really should come to india every two to three weeks stay for a week and get an update what's happening see for yourself you know uh, what's happening here uh, if any critical decisions are to be taken on the site on the spot can be taken you know, if any deviations have to be approved, all these things. So it will be working directly under the guidance and supervision of, but you don't really have to send somebody to India, I'll tell you why. Unless that person or the entity has experience of setting up plants in India, right? Don't mm -hmm. send that person. Because that, that person or entity will get frustrated in India. It will yeah. be complicated. By the time they understand what happens in India and how it happens, the project will be over. 
and uh, it does not help we've had in the past i can tell you from experience there were uh, examples where the companies did send somebody from their china plant or from from their you know german plant but within two or three months it was evident that this gentleman did not or these gentlemen did not really understand how the working on the ground happens in india where they came with the best technical knowledge experience but getting it translated into india you need an indian to do that there's no other way not yet maybe in 20 okay, years that's clear. i think yeah. that's clear wonderful Thanks. okay sure so next one please so coming to the key contractors uh, yes this is one area where again there is some general tendency of not being serious and this applies to both very big contractors and small ones as well so what you should look uh, for you know that the uh, labor could be an e e you know easy issue which crops up every time while well, india is a large country a lot of you know people available but sometimes either the contractor will divert the labor to other uh, projects they could be harvesting seasons they could be you know some festivals and there are enough festivals in india labor will go away so we have to ensure that the contractor is appointing the number of if you need 500 people for your site they should be 500 people at any given point in time right competence of the subcontractors because the contractors will not do everything on their own they will outsource a lot of stuff which is normal but then you should have a say <coughs> excuse me in the selection of the subcontractors and they also should be monitored the contractor cannot say because i subcontracted the quality cannot be assured no that's not allowed so again the monitoring i referred in the earlier slide is to be there right now when you sign up a contract with a contractor in india there will already be a column for ehs you know employee uh, health and safety right which means the right tools right implements uh, personal protection equipment safety i'll come to safety later Uh, but all these things are there and you will pay for that right they will say okay fine if you want so many ppe kits to be there then this is the additional cost you so okay fine safety is very important but sometimes they will not provide those tools or implements or safety gear this has to be also monitored right they will try to save cost they have got it from you but they will not give it to people on the site happens so some things could be surprising for you that how could it be but it happens all the time so those things have to be again taken care of and last but not the least the delays by contractors now this is something which you have to live with it's almost impossible to get a contractor to adhere to timelines for multiple reasons sometimes it could be deliberate on their part because another project came up which was of a higher value or needs some fire fighting there so they will divert people from your site or sometimes it could just plain old habit bad habit that yeah or no worries what how does it matter a couple of months here or there right so how do you ensure that it it's done properly so first of all the selection of the key contractors you know whether it's a civil contractor or the key equipment supplier for utilities it has to be carefully done right and uh, i i would always recommend that you know go for the better ones the larger ones especially who have more than one city presence because then they have more wherewithal they have more resources which can be deployed if needed right in an urgent situation they will come at a higher cost yes but then uh, you are assured to a greater extent that they will be available when you need and of course monitoring i will continue repeating you have to closely monitor because uh, if you don't then you may have issues with quality and timelines later mm. these of course have analyzed i'll come to that next quality i already quickly mentioned uh, earlier while well with the contractors so uh, a reason why quality is not so good in india could be or is other is that the workers are generally not trained people you know unlike let's say in the west you would get skilled training into becoming a mason for example right or a plumber or electrician whatever in india it has only started recently with the government's initiative of skill india the last 4 5 years before that it was not so still most of the workers are not trained it's like a family business they they learn from their father from their grandfather and then they continue if they learn the wrong way they know that is the way right they would not do the right way so how do you do this you know so you have to keep monitoring closely uh, also to save on costs because a skilled worker will come at a higher cost beyond the minimum wages the contractors may want to save money over there they may get less competent workers unskilled or semi skilled workers again has to be checked 
And I think the, the most important thing on this uh, quality aspect is setting the expectations. Uh, you will come with expectations that yes, I want an equivalent of my factory in Germany or Netherlands or Belgium, France, wherever you come from. And I want a replica there. I'm going to spend money. I want it. Now, one should understand, and, and this I have again seen from experience, that sometimes the clients don't want to understand that in India it could be different. They say, no, no, I'm spending the same amount of money and energy and everything. I want the same. So that expectations is something which should be set in the beginning and wherever there are gaps, they should be agreed to beforehand, before you even start planning the you know, work. Otherwise, there'll be problems later because you will expect something else which will not be delivered. And then, you know, there's a problem. There's a dispute and nobody wants disputes after the projects are over. How do you overcome? Hire good contractors. And that ensures that you get good workers as well because the good contractor, the bigger contractor will also invest time in training and retraining those workers. The smaller ones don't have money or the, the interest to train those people. And the understanding and benchmark of quality levels, I think this is very important, right? Should be done in the beginning of the project. You agree to disagree at the beginning of the project so that there's no disagreements later. But once you have decided, then you should rigorously follow and monitor those things, which is where I say the program manager uh, comes in very handy. Next. Mm -hmm. Now, timelines again is related to quality. Sometimes you will hear people saying, oh, you want this level of quality, it'll take more time. Not necessarily, but that's how we typically tend to think. So here, the general approach could be, yes, how does it matter if it's a delay of you know a few weeks or a few months in some cases? No. So there you have to have a closer coordination, right? Sometimes out of, as I said, general habit, people delay. Sometimes there could be genuine reasons but they should be agreed and discussed every time there is a possibility of a delay happening, not just letting it happen. I mentioned already about labor fluctuation during seasons, you know, festivals or harvesting. These all should be anticipated during your planning phase itself. We know already the entire year when that particular harvesting season will come, whether they will want to go back to the villages uh, to you know, harvest or the festivals. So these are the contingencies that you would have. Contingencies also could be Monsoons, for example, in India, right? About two, two and a half months from the month of mid of July till mid of September or beginning of September, we have monsoons, which means heavy rains. Almost all construction work comes to a standstill, right? So if you started your construction rates in the month of March and it would take maybe, let's say, 10, 10 or 12 months, so you will hit monsoon anyways. So you have to plan that, that in those two months, two and a half months, maybe almost no construction happens. So what do you do? How do you plan you know your activities during that zero activity period all those things right so these are the contingencies which you have to factor in which in other parts of the world may not be there or maybe some different contingencies and the timelines should be communicated to the agencies right should be different from the actual ones so i find that you know very uh, unique thing and it's a good thing actually that the europeans are very honest people so you'll say yes uh, my project duration is 10 months so i want to start production in 10 months time honestly now, if you say the same thing to the uh, people on the ground, uh, assuming that uh, since I say 10 months, so they will be done in 10 months time. No. So you should have a cushion, a buffer in between, right? How much of a buffer should be there will depend on uh, looking at the project, you know, details. But it could be anywhere between two to six months also, right? There are so many factors which will ensure that you have a buffer communicated to other agencies on the ground so that they have a tighter deadline than you have. And you still are not falling behind your actual launch date. Otherwise, if you say 10 months and they understand 15 months, then you have a problem. And you cannot fight later saying, I told you 10 months. They say, yeah, but you know, this yeah. happened, that happened. Next, the last point I think is about safety. And then we go to the questions, yes. Oh, that's okay. so cool. we have cost. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the cost, of course, uh, I'll, I'll quickly take you through this um, because uh, I think we are running against time now. I'll take maybe a minute on this. So this again is something which has to be done very, very, very carefully, right? Uh, costs in India typically are much lower as compared to other places, right? Um, how much uh, you may ask, it, it varies. It could be as low as 40 to 50 percent. In some cases, it could be low as 20 percent. Depends on what kind of a factory are you trying to build. Is it a Taj Mahal which you want to erect in India, or is it you know a functional facility? So there, you should do a detailed budgeting exercise. You know, and, and we strongly recommend again using the program management you know, company to help you with that. 
and not insisting that whatever I have back home should be the same thing over here as well. If you can save costs, right, with alternatives in India, which are equally effective, not compromising on the quality of your functionality, we strongly recommend that please follow that, right? That that concern of fear that you know this equipment bought from India may not be very effective. Trust you know uh, us on that. Trust experts on that who will guide you that yes, it's possible. And only when you're convinced that you should find I can also go with a local supplier. But this is important, right? So cost escalations also will happen. We should have that budgeted again beforehand. And there again, an Indian entity can help you understand where escalations could happen. In spite of your best planning, I can tell you in India, escalations will happen. Again, like the Murphy law. But how do you minimize those escalations, right? Now, the bill of quantities which you prepare initially have to be verified, have to be. It's not that the, the architect gave you a bill of quantities and then you say that's gospel, right? So I just don't uh, look beyond. No, that should be verified, must be verified, right? To see if there are some things which the architects or the other designers have taken on a higher side. Sometimes the tendency that say international, big international company, so maybe they want the best of the best. Maybe we give them more, you know, expensive or international equipment and, you know, uh, products or utilities. Whereas uh, you just need the utility, right? It doesn't have to be really imported from, uh, let's say, France to be installed in India when you can already have it here. Saves you cost. All these things should be done. So the detailings of the specifications is very important. Like I said, the homologation of your engineering brief, which you start in your home, you know, your home facility, home country, that should be there. Budget should be prepared realistically, not to please the client. Very common tactic. The other tactic is okay fine to get the assignment i should put a lower fee lower you know figure for cost lower everything yeah yeah and you are impressed wow it would be so less a cost in india and when you sign up and after one month oh sir no no by the way this will cost more because now you want something else and then it's frustrating for you right you say but you should have told me beforehand now i have got the budget approved by the board i cannot keep going back to them because every time you come back saying you know i need a hundred thousand more or two hundred thousand more over here so all of those things should be done before and I can tell you again from experience several times it leads to sometimes a stoppage of the project because the board refuses to give an extra penny and you say what do I do now I can't do anything it's not a good situation so all these things should be done beforehand and contingency I mentioned already should be built maybe maybe uh, related also to, to to safety the next uh, slide that's coming in but someone is asking in, in setting standards is it common to use certain quality standards like iso or nen or din is this is, is this we common have indian in standards. as well so, yeah so there are indian standards which one has to uh, your standards normally are much higher than the indian standards the european standards or the din standards are normally much higher than the standards but for India, you have to only follow the Indian standards. Even if you, and we have again examples, um, there was a plant we set up for a German company, a large one, uh, we set up a large plant. So the firefighting system, it's very amusing, maybe I'll take a minute to explain this to you. The firefighting system they had was uh, much ahead of, you know, this was I think a few years ago. This was already much ahead of uh, what India had seen even, right? It was a plant uh, they imported from the US, cost a bomb, almost five, six times more than what was needed. And the entire thing was set up. When the fire safety officer came to approve, that yeah, this is how it is. So he came with a very old Indian you know, fire safety book, maybe 50 or 40 years old, and said, okay, show me on in this. I mean, he was standing in the middle of it. It was a huge building you know, in the basement. Uh, so he was standing there, so fine. On your drawing, show me where is this drawing which is needed as per this fire safety manual. And it took so much of you know, effort for everyone. Incidentally, the fires, the, the utility guy who set up the plant, uh, the fire safety plant was also there. Everyone tried to explain to this guy that this is much ahead, you know, decades ahead of what you are holding in your hand. You don't, you don't even know what it is. He said, I don't care. I want this. If you can throw, show this like this, it is there, then it's fine. You will not believe they took two weeks extra to create a smaller you know, facility there in the thing, which was like what he saw in the book, brought him again after two weeks. So hmm. lost two weeks, spent more money. So Indian standards is what you have to look at. There's a black book, which you know, we can give it to you. You can buy, it's all available. And then that is what you have to follow. 
so actually being too advanced can be yeah maybe it's yeah a company can say but we find this necessary we do this with all our plans but you say in india this can be a disadvantage actually to be so it uh, could be yes yeah to be really uh, going on like so no it should be like I, this yeah so i repeat that you know i said that the word i use the word homologation right so that adaption you know of, of your uh, actual plant uh, specifications technical specifications to the indian conditions is very important right mm. not only will it save you money it will save you a lot of hassles also because once the plant starts growing, for example this is we are talking of construction right during the construction pre production stage when you start production again there will be a lot of you know people who will the officials will come in and will inspect your plant is it running as per you know, the the drawings you submitted did you make any modifications and all and if they again find something which was already there but they did not understand beforehand they might again say what is it why did you install this so it becomes a topic of you know explanation explaining every time but if you have mm -hmm. taken care of beforehand and those officials have been explained and their agreement taken, then you have a smooth, you know, working plant later. So that that's where I'm I'm uh, Yeah. Safety, quick, uh, maybe a minute on this. Safety, is something which in India, unfortunately, both the contractors and the workers themselves are not really much concerned about. Unfortunate, I know, but that's how it is. So it's imperative, especially for an international company, to lay more focus and emphasis on the safety, so that the workers you know they are uh, protected. And uh, if they are not protecting themselves, then they should be penalized, monetarily penalized. And you will be surprised that on the site, workers are penalized, right? Their money is deducted from their daily wages if they're not wearing proper, you know, even shoes, for example. You'll find people walking bare feet on the sites. It's, it's a war zone, right? When the construction site is like a war zone, how can you walk without helmets or, or, or gloves in some cases or hanging like a spider man, you know, from the 50 meter height? without any harness and all, it all happens on the, on the site when it's happening. But when you're ensured that this does not happen and they are penalized or sent back from the site, it has a great impact on everyone around. Mm. So if you penalize one worker, trust me, the other two, three hundred on the site fall in line. Till so, maybe that's a best, uh, so that's a best practice actually to penalize monetarily. Yes, yes. It, it might sound a little harsh, but that's how it is. What works in India has to be, you know, done that way. Yeah. Yeah. Safety officer is something which you should necessarily appoint only for the purpose of safety. Many contractors will tell you, sir, not needed, you know, because it will add to the cost, right? You say, no worries, it's better. Because something happens to the, you know, uh, workers on the site, then the directors are liable, right? <clears throat> and yeah, companies are liable. So to, you have to safeguard your interest. If, even if they don't want to safeguard their interest, you as a company have to safeguard your interest. So yeah. next. So I've just, this is a very, very, very tiny little, you know, list of some international iconic companies which have set up their plants in India. I've been there for decades now. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other international companies, big, small, medium, all kinds, which are, uh, why I mentioned some of these names, and these are you know, known for their best quality, and some of them are Dutch companies as well, I see here. They're known for their best quality of things anywhere in the world. No compromises, right? Whatever they will sell anywhere will be the same quality. Prices may differ, but the quality will not. So if they can make it in India, right, and sell comfortably for years now, for decades now, I think everyone can. So to conclude, I'll bring to my last uh, you know, slide here. Maybe maybe I'll go already to one of the questions because uh, yes, please. I, 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 you mentioned it briefly. Uh, and I see we're almost on the in the time, so maybe people have to have to leave already. But one of the questions was, was about the possibilities to protect uh, IP. Uh, and you were saying something earlier on that the courts will give it priority. But what can be done uh, beforehand to 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 protect IP? See, beforehand, of course, when you come and want to set up, you of course have to apply to the registrar, you know, to local registrar, to say yes, this is my you know brand, right? So when you set up a company, well, start at that level. Right? So the name of your company, if you want to be registered in a particular way, has to be applied to the ROC. And then you also apply to the trademarks in office, registrar's office, right? To get it uh, you know, uh, registered over here. At that stage itself, you'll get to know whether your brand already has been infringed in India or not. 
whether somebody mm -hmm. already is that brand or not. So if somebody else is using that brand, then you can take you know legal recourse, right? And figure out whether you know that brand can be taken off or that that entity can be prohibited from using that brand because now you are in India or you will be in India. So they might mm -hmm. have used it because they challenged it so far. So these things are the first things which you have to do when you because if you're coming for the first time, you have to set up a legal entity, right? You have to set up a private limited to set up a factory, a production facility. And when you do that, these things are done at that stage so that you know whether I'm already entering into some choppy waters or clear water and I know what lies ahead. Mm -hmm. So these are things you do beforehand. And of course, unfortunately, if, if later, you know, somebody you find that, you know, has already copied your brand and start selling the same product, then of course you go to the courts and then mm. the legal takes over. But normally it's not that bad, I can tell you. If you compare to China, I can assure you it's, it's miles ahead. It's much better here. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe maybe it's good because we're almost uh, over over time. Just to make your uh, do the conclusion. And uh, I think we're going to round off if we don't have other questions uh, coming in. So uh, Okay. So, I mean, conclusion is all, all what I already said before. So, it's a large domestic market with abundant pool of you know, young, uh, talented people who are affordable. So, it's not about why should I set up in India a production facility. It is when should I set up. It's a matter of time. The sooner you do, I think the more benefits you reap. And it's not only for domestic consumption. You can also use India as an export base. I already mentioned India has a geographical advantage, right? It's almost like the center of this half of the earth, you know, from Europe to um, down south, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and from Japan to Africa. It's kind of at the center point. So that could be, you know, another area. And the uh, challenges, of course, are there, and I mentioned uh, those challenges. But if you plan properly, um, you've seen all these companies have set up plants and more, they're expanding, they're setting up more plants. So you can also do a good job. Mm -hmm. Program management is something which should be taken up seriously. So when you set up a, a factory in India, production facility, whatever size doesn't matter, you should engage a company which has experience, especially from a European or international perspective, because the perspective is very important. If it is just Indian perspective, there are tons of Indian companies who would do program management, but they would not understand you know, from your perspective. So you will talk Greek, they will talk French, and you will never come you know, on the same page. So somebody who has that experience comes from that helps. And uh, like I said, these bigger companies have you know, set up uh, plants, they're expanding. Uh, Mercedes, by the way, you know, this Daimler uh, last week, uh, it was in the newspapers that the global CEO said that they might now look at exporting from India, uh, you know, Mercedes cars for the rest of the world. Apple started you know, making in India last year. They started with uh, Apple 7, 7, then they went Apple 10R. Now they're making 11 in India, which mm -hmm. was unheard. Steve Jobs never wanted to come to India. <laughs> when they launched I, uh, iPhone, he said iPhone is not for India. And now they're making in India. So see, it's, it's, it's only 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's a much dynamic, Maybe. you know. Yeah. Maybe interesting related to this producing in India and exporting to the uh, to the exporting out of India. Uh, someone is asking uh, this will be under VAT, so uh, GST, like, like GST needs to be paid or not? No, but so that, exports you don't pay. It, uh, the export is not VAT. No, so exports there are in, in, pay incentives by the government. The government gives you benefits when you export from because you are earning foreign exchange for the country. So exports are uh, different. Yeah. Import yeah. attracts all those VAT and GST and all those things. Exports, you are encouraged by the government to export. All right, then is that, uh, that uh, question is then also answered. Um, I, I think you've come to the final slide, uh, right? Or there's one more slide that, that, that I can be contacted for, uh, uh, for further questions, of course. And what I didn't say in the beginning, but of course, uh, maybe people were already aware of this, but uh, India Connected is, of course, an uh, exclusive partner of my in, uh for the Netherlands and, and, and Belgium. Uh, so we are cooperating closely, and uh, of course, we can help in, uh, in this, this process, finding the right uh, people, finding the right um, uh, yeah, or doing the doing the advisory work to uh, to help companies in India. Um, 
So with that being said, and having looked at the at the questions, uh, I would like to thank you, Shavikesh, for your for your presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody for listening, uh, and uh, we will send a file of this. This uh, we've we've recorded the session, so we'll send it back to all of you, so you can uh, have a look at it later, also, or share with with colleagues. Um, and uh, we, if you have, of course, if you have any other questions, uh, be back with us. You know how to find us. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'm going to round off. Thank you all for, for being there, for, for listening. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Martin. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.